Root of Nightmares Raid Guide. You want to get it done, so let's get into it. This guide will cover each encounter, both secret chests, and also the extra red border chest puzzle. So everything you need to know to complete runs every time. The first thing we'll cover here is how to start the red border chest puzzle. Make your way down from the start of the raid until you see these three giant flowers which will be glowing light or dark. Memorize the order from left to right, write it down in the chat, whatever you need to do, just keep it memorized. You'll need to activate either light or dark orbs that are throughout the raid that will obviously match the order that you see here at the beginning. The first area that you'll need to interact with is up ahead just a bit before the Cataclysm first encounter. Instead of progressing toward Cataclysm, go through the door on the side and follow the path downstairs. You'll eventually come across this dark room that will let you activate these dark or light orbs. We'll be covering this mechanic heavily in this guide as it is a huge part of this raid, but for now, the first orb in the sequence is supposed to be dark, then find the dark aura with the orb in the middle, pick up the buff from it by shooting it, and take it over to where it's pointing you toward to the other dark orb. You only have to connect one here. And once successful, you'll see the text, your actions take root. Now you can move on, and if you just are here for this guide to see the positions of the next two orb locations, don't worry, I'll chapter out this video so you can just skip ahead to where you need to go to next. All right, so follow the opening path down just a little bit through some enemy groups, and then you'll eventually make it to the opening encounter. Cataclysm. This is where your objective is just to survive. This is a very straightforward encounter and will teach you the main mechanic of the raid as well. Designate one player to be the runner and five remaining players to be the ad clearers. This is the easiest way to get this section done by far and to have the best possible experience, the runner should be your team's best mobility player. It's not really that hard, but it just helps having someone that has an eager edge sword and is just generally good at destiny movement. Okay, so how does this encounter work? The runner will start things off by shooting this orb that's hovering in this light aura to pick up the field of light buff and also give everyone in the fire team the sweeping terror debuff but we'll come back to that in just a second. And for continuity's sake, for the duration of this guide, I'm just gonna go ahead and call the orb with this aura around it, the buff bubble, because it's the only location that this field of light buff can be picked up. Okay, back to it. Shooting the orb in the buff bubble will also emit this tiny beam of light that will point the runner toward the next orb they have to shoot. And once they shoot the next orb, this will activate it to where that orb will now point to a new third orb. And once an orb is activated, the runner's field of light buff will be consumed, so they won't be able to see it any longer in their buff screen. So what they'll need to do is head back to the buff bubble to shoot the orb again, pick up the buff again, and then go find the next orb in the chain. One thing on getting the Field of Light buff, if you already have it and you shoot the orb again, it will cause all the orbs in the chain to disappear for about 15 seconds, dramatically slowing down the runner. So don't shoot it if you already have the buff. And if you're not the runner, just don't shoot him at all. The buff bubble will also usually be two orbs back in the chain that you've been connecting. So just know that as you connect more orbs, that buff bubble will move as well. Just look for the big light aura surrounding it and you'll be totally fine. It usually just takes a quick scan of the area to find it if you ever get lost. And the order that each orb will point the runner to is kind of random. It will usually be somewhat next in the chain, so it will never have the runner go all the way back to the end, then go all the way back to the beginning. It's usually one or the other of the next ones in the sequence. And once the runner successfully activates each orb in the chain, the feed will show that his hatred halts, indicating that you've completed that section and can move forward to progress. So now let's switch over to the ad clearer side and see what they'll be doing before we move on with this encounter. The ad clear team will prioritize killing the two special scions that will be floating in these bubbles, very similar to the Leviathan Raid or Leviathan Nightmare Containment. Killing both of these scions will spawn in a barrier champion as well as a tormentor. One will randomly spawn on the right and one on the left side where you'll be progressing the encounter. You need to prioritize the Tormentor at all costs, as doing so will extend this Sweeping Terror debuff by about 30 seconds. Sweeping Terror is the team wipe mechanic here, so you'll constantly be racing against time to finish this encounter. This is kind of a similar thing throughout this raid as you'll see. So these floating scions will spawn in multiple times per section, so always be on the lookout once the Tormentor and Barrier Champions are killed. If you want to, what's worked for us is trying to have a couple players that are designated to be the Scion Scouts, and once they kill the scions, they can then help with the Tormentor and other adds before looking for more scions. 
So now that we're familiar with all the roles, let's finish up this encounter. Your team will need to complete four orb chains with each one adding an additional orb, I believe, and also making the path just a little bit more difficult. So you'll need to look out a little bit harder to clear these. So add clear team needs to stay on top of it by looking for those scions and killing the tormentors immediately as they appear. And that's it for Cataclysm. You should be able to get this one done pretty easily once you get the hang of it. All right, once Cataclysm is cleared, you'll have to platform a bit to get to the next encounter. That's kind of a reoccurring theme with this raid. There's a lot of running. Just look out for ledges to climb up on and gaps to cross, things to drop down into. Just make sure you stop and jump off to the right to pick up your first secret chest. There is going to be a giant tormentor here guarding this chest, but he's not too difficult to deal with. And once you get this chest, just keep progressing forward. You're almost there to the second encounter. All right, so we are here at the Scission encounter, or the really buggy one as it stands right now. You'll need to assign a second runner now that will essentially be doing the exact same thing that the original runner did in the first encounter. Nothing changes here, except now there's also a new darkness aura with dark orbs that have to be connected in addition to the light orbs. Again, I'd highly recommend both runners equip their eager edge swords since it makes it so much easier and you can really just clutch out and save moments with so much extra time that you're going to save. Before starting the encounter, split up into two teams of three three on the right with the light aura, and three on the left with the dark aura. The team on the right will have to have the field of light buff active as often as possible, and yes, that's everyone on the right side, including the non-runners, and the team on the left will also have to have the new Flux of Darkness buff active, and we'll get to why in just a second. First, let's tackle the job of the runners. Runners will start the encounter by, again, ensuring that each player on their designated side is inside the buff bubbles before shooting their orbs simultaneously. This will ensure that each player either has a Field of Light or Flux of Darkness buff for 15 seconds. The runners will obviously need the buff to connect the orbs, and they'll be zigzagging across the room by utilizing the extremely finicky launch pads to do so. The good thing here though is that unlike the last encounter, each of these orbs has a set path, so you really can memorize it. Check out this map here by Meme Man Kaido. It shows each orb location, which is really helpful, but I promise you it's still gonna take a little bit of practice to really learn the path. Just keep repeating it, you'll eventually get it. My team found it easiest to have each runner stick to their original light or darkness buff. Runners can swap between connecting light or dark as they switch sides. It can save a couple seconds, but it's really confusing and it has a tendency to just make things mess up. We wiped more often by trying to save a few seconds of time. When both runners stick to the same buff the whole time and start to get the pathing down, you all should have plenty of time left over so you don't have to save time. Just try to follow my pathing here to see how it plays out. It really is easy but the time is again the main boss that you'll be fighting here. Let the timer run down to zero before connecting both light and dark orbs, and it's a wipe. And that's it for the runners, let's hop over to see what the non-runners will be doing. So non-runners or the four ad clearing players will not be zigzagging across the map. They will instead be remaining on their side, but will push forward as the runners connect their orbs. They'll need to have as much uptime on their light or darkness buff to deal with these unique shielded enemies that can only be killed while these buffs are active. Light shielded enemies will have a white shield and darkness shielded enemies will have an orange shield. And again, just a reminder, ad clearers do not need to swap sides here. These enemies will always spawn in on the side that corresponds with their shield affinities. So dark enemies will always spawn on dark side, light on light. Okay, you got it. So what my team likes to do is have the runner call out something like, okay, heading back to buff light, letting the light ad clearers know to hop in their buff bubble to get their light buff. And the same thing with dark. Or if you're an ad clearer and you notice that your buff timer is running out, just head back to the buff bubble because that runner is gonna have to come back there eventually and they can buff you up then. Once your team is proficient in this encounter, you should be able to have the buff active on the ad clearers almost the whole time though. Just keep in mind that the buff bubbles will start to move up as the runners connect more orbs, kind of like the last encounter. So make sure you're looking for that light or dark aura surrounding the orb since that's the only spot that you'll be able to acquire this buff. So once you fully complete a set of orbs, more shielded enemies will pour out of the door that's at the furthest point away from where you started, so you should already be there anyway. You'll obviously need a buff up to kill these shielded enemies, and don't worry, they're not that difficult to kill. And the wipe timer will also vanish once you connect both sides, so you can really take your time when killing this last group of enemies. Once you kill this final group of shielded enemies on either side, a darkness crystal, or nut as we call it, will appear in front of the final launcher, letting you activate it. This is where things get weird. It will sometimes launch you up to the third floor, sometimes to the first floor. It's annoying and it can waste precious seconds 
as the encounter will occasionally just start automatically before you're able to make it to the buff bubble. Either way, as long as you're moving along the path correctly, you should be finishing up with a good amount of time to spare so you can recover if that happens. You'll have to complete three floors to finish the encounter, with each floor getting a little bit more complex than the previous floor, but it's nothing that you can't handle, it just takes practice, that's all. Once you're done with the encounter, you'll have to hop up into this flower area that will open up for you, and then you'll be taken to this flower tunnel where you'll have to connect both light and dark sides. This is really easy. Just find where the light starts, find where the dark starts, have two people just start connecting them. This room is pretty small, so I'm not gonna explain it in too much detail for you. The next part is interesting. It's by far the longest trek in any raid from memory, so buckle up. Like every other encounter, it just takes practice, but expect to be here for a while if it's your first time running it, especially if it's your whole team's first time running it. Nezarak will essentially be sending out these death blasts every 20 seconds or so for the full duration of this entire journey. You'll be taking launchers, going through tight corridors, and jumping around to get to safety. Thankfully, you can survive these death blasts by utilizing both the light and dark auras to get a new buff called Darkness's Refuge. You can do so by first shooting the light aura, then the dark, and anyone can shoot the orbs at any time, so they're not going to disappear like they do in the other encounters. The cool thing here is that all it takes is one person to shoot the light and then shoot the dark, and then once that happens, that Darkness Refuge buff will happen, but that dark plate will glow orange, letting anyone, regardless if they have the light buff or not, they can just stand in it and get that Darkness Refuge buff, so it really helps out. Light and dark buff bubbles will be sprinkled around the area, so learning where they are is really going to help this encounter speed up, but they usually are in plain sight somewhat. But about halfway through, you'll come across this area where you'll need to activate that second orb for the red border chest puzzle. And again, the same text will pop up letting you know that you're successful, letting you know that your actions take root. And a little while ahead of that location, you'll have to take a launcher over. You'll get to this second secret chest. Your whole fire team will need to make it to this point to open up this door. And once it's opened, run over to this area, shoot the nut to open this door, and then pick up your secret chest inside the building and continue to press on to the next encounter. And once you're done with the Death March, you'll eventually make it to the Planets Encounter. This will likely be your first major test of the raid, since you'll actually be dealing with a boss now. Split up into three teams of two here, two teams of planet shifters and one team of ad clearers. Explaining this encounter might seem just really intense, but I promise you it's really simple. You're basically just picking up something and moving it to the other side and the other teammate is doing the same thing at its simplest form. So distribute your teams around the room like this. Add clear team will always be in the middle and each person on planet shift team will take a triangular plate. This map here is what we've been using to help teach and kind of show the orientation of the room. So thanks to Joe Gibbons for making it. But keep this map open on the side if you need to. It really helps with callouts and just making sure you're putting everything in the right place. Once everyone is in place, shoot the boss to start the encounter. Everyone should be focusing ads for the first 10 seconds or so, especially the yellow bar centurions in the middle. Once these centurions are killed, a giant lieutenant will spawn in on each one of the triangular platforms. Once this happens, everyone will get the planetary shift buff that will allow us to pick up and move planets around. Obviously, only the four players on the plates will be utilizing this buff, but ad clearers don't need to worry about this. Players who kill these giant lieutenants will acquire the planetary affinity buff. This will allow them to see which planet on their plate needs to be moved. And keep in mind these lieutenants have really bad balance as they fall off the platforms just about every other time. So just make sure you're not like pushing them off because if you do, you will not get the buff and you just can't progress the encounter until more spawn in wasting a lot of time. Okay, so how do you know which planet needs to be grabbed? Well, if you look up, you can see that there will be one planet that is out of place. If you're on the right side of the room, you'll be looking for a light planet out of place. If you're on the left side of the room, you'll be looking for a dark planet out of place. The way it should end up is that all the light planets should be on the left side of the room and all the dark planets need to end up on the right side of the room. That's the end goal here. So you'll need to swap planets with the player across from you as that player across from you will be bringing their out of place planet over to your side. Utilizing this numbers system as seen on this graphic makes things just really easy. So in this example shown here, I'd say something like R4 if I'm bringing over my R4 planet to the left side and my partner would say L4 if they needed to take their L4 over to my side. 
Now I would know I have to take my planet to L4 and my partner would take their planet to R4. We're literally just picking up the planet from our side and swapping them with each other. And the one through three plate team will also be doing the exact same thing. Just make sure to keep an eye on your planetary shift buff though, as you don't have tons of time to wait around, it's like 20 seconds before it expires, you should immediately be running to where you need to go as soon as you get planetary shift and can pick up your planet. As long as each planet is shifted correctly, the planets will do this cool glow animation. And once you do this, it's time to do one more small alignment by aligning the three middle planets now. You'll need to wait just a bit to be able to do this, you can't do it right away. Just continue to stay on the plate that you deposited your planet on, no need to go back to your original position. Planet shifters will again have to help the Adclair team clear the Centurions out that will spawn in again to get a new set of lieutenants that will also spawn in on the platforms all over again. Same mechanics here, again, the player who kills that lieutenant will acquire the planetary affinity buff. Any player that has planetary affinity will be able to see the true nature of the three middle planets, which will be a mixture of light and dark. My team likes to call it from left to right, so if it's dark, light, dark, that would mean the left is dark, the middle is light, and the right is dark. If you don't see all of the middle planets glowing as light or dark while you have the planetary insight buff, that means that one or both teams did not align the planets correctly. Just look up to see which planet is messed up. If you see one that's still out of place, you'll have to redo that set of planets. So both players in that set will have to swap. So assuming you did everything correctly, once all three planets in the middle glow as light or dark, while you've got planetary insight, your goal is to grab the needed planets from these triangular platforms and deposit them on the plates underneath the three middle planets. The cool thing here is that only three players need to grab a planet, since there are only three planets in the middle, and they can also grab any planet they want as long as it's the correct affinity. So since all the left side will be light and all the right side will be dark, it's very easy to designate who's gonna grab which planet and deposit where. You know, whatever it is, just make sure your team has a system set up so you're not double depositing on the same one because that doesn't work either. And once those three middle planets are correctly aligned, now it's time for damage. The boss will eventually hop off his platform and jump down, revealing a shield affinity, light or dark. You'll need to quickly jump onto a matching plate to acquire the buff to damage him. We found it's best to have one person calling out which plate to go to, that way there's not six people trying to come up with the right direction. You just want everyone to go to the same plate and take the buff at the same time. We'll have about six seconds of this buff being active before he'll get another light or dark shield, meaning that you'll need to hop on the next plate to be able to do damage again. The nice thing here is that you don't need to stay on the plate, you can move around if you need to. Our best method is setting up a well in the very middle, making it easy to go to either one of the platforms. So you can basically just go to the plate, dip into the buff, and then head back to the well to get that boosted damage. One thing to keep in mind though is stepping on or even hovering over any of the plates at the wrong time will consume that plate's buff, meaning it's essentially just a wasted damage opportunity. We found that one divinity and five thunderlords actually is extremely easy for damage. Of course, G Horn and Rockets also does great here. Just do whatever works best for your team and that'll work. And once he goes immune for the third time, you'll basically have to rinse and repeat for three damage phases before the enrage mechanic sets in. And once you reach the final stand health bar part, he'll take a break for a couple seconds and then all three plates will be glowing orange. I really honestly don't know how this works yet. I feel like you could just kind of stand on any of the plates, but my team just in case has been just going from one to the other and it's just kind of like a mad rush to kill the boss. But either way, it's pretty easy. As long as you have ammo, you should be able to deal with this pretty easily. That's it for that one. Hopefully you guys can get it. It's not too bad once you learn the mechanics. Let's move on to Nezarek. Immediately after that planet's encounter, you will have another one of these areas where you have to connect a few light and dark things, but it's really easy. Just connect them and the door will open. So we've got a little bit more platforming before we can make our way to Nezarek. Thankfully, no death blasts this time though, so it will be a lot easier. But right before you get to Nezarak, like literally right before, head down to this platform down on your right. If you look up, you can jump into this hidden room for your third and final red border chest orb location. You'll see the next light or darkness buff location. Just pick whichever one is needed for you. Again, that's gonna be the third one and jump to the second floor to activate whichever one you need. It's a tiny room, so you can't miss it. If you've done all three correctly, you'll see that a great harvest awaits in the kill feed. So cool, now you get a free random red border once you kill Nazarek. nice. And this can only be done once per week per account, so you can't farm this three times per week on each character, so just keep that in mind. 
All right, now we are at Nezarek. Let's finish this. There are two strategies for this fight. One is faster, but more risky. One is slower, but safer. I'll cover both here. My team, we just do the safe method. It just makes wiping less frequent. It's a little bit easier to understand, even though it takes like 15 seconds longer. But I'll just let you know, if you don't have two very highly skilled movement players that can do Icarus Dash, Shoulder Charge, or any other movement tech, don't even bother with this fast method as you simply just won't have enough time to do it. But if you want to go with it, we'll cover the fast method first to make sure everyone is in the correct positions and doing the right thing, let's assign roles. You've got a light runner, a dark runner, a taunter, and three ad clearers. Let's start with the runners first. You'll have to do the usual light and darkness bubble stuff on either side of the arena. I really don't need to explain that now. It's literally the same thing as you've been doing. As long as you can connect all six orbs on either side in under around 60 seconds, you can go straight to the damage phase as long as the person taunting can do so successfully. So taunting is done by damaging Nezarak's shoulders and then his chest once that's revealed. And this is done while he's on his platform area. If the taunter waits too long after Nezarak starts up, he'll lock his hatred onto the whole fire team and that's indicated by the purple haze on his screen. This will send everyone on an infinite loop of getting booped, yep that rhymed, making it nearly impossible for the runners to do what they need to do. What I like to do is wait for him to launch his carpet bomb attack where the purple projectiles are kind of sent all over the battlefield, then shoot his shoulders. Once both shoulders are destroyed, shoot his chest to capture his hatred for 10 seconds. Now his hatred will only be on the taunter, not the whole team. So once you do that, he'll jump down from his platform and start wreaking havoc on the whole arena. So if the ad clear is able to, they can shoot his chest to recapture the hatred since the original taunter might not always be in a good position to capture it and the hatred only lasts 10 seconds on the original taunter so someone else should try and grab it if possible so after one minute once the encounter starts he's going to start to glow indicating that the death blast white mechanic is about to take place as long as the runners can complete their orb set before the blast happens you'll be totally fine and that's it for the quick method let's talk about the slow and safe method before we move on to the damage phase everything remains exactly the same with the slow method except we add one additional mechanic if your team is not a bunch of movement tech sweat lords that's okay you're in luck because you can avoid the death blast by getting light or dark refuge very similar to the death march encounter so how do you do this well when the taunter shoots the shoulders off nezarak a light or dark aura will glow around him for about one second the taunter should then call light or dark letting the runners know which side the team needs to take refuge on that would mean that the runner from the light side would need to take their field of light buff to any of the already activated dark orbs. The runner would then shoot the dark orb to give everyone darkness refuge on that plate. As long as your team has a buff, you won't die when the death blast happens and you can resume the mechanics of the encounter right from where you left off. Taunter shoots the shoulders, checks for light or dark, gets the taunt, and then waits for the runners to complete their orb sets. What we've found is after about the 30 second mark, that seemed to be a good time for the runner who is getting refuge to grab their buff and bring it to the other side. If you wait too long, your team is not gonna have enough time to run over to the correct orb spot and get refuge, so they're just gonna die by the death blast. So that's why 30 seconds has seemed to be about the right time for us. Just find the sweet spot that works for your team. So whichever method you choose here, once you see the completion animation for both sets of orbs, head to the designated damage platform. My team just started going to this platform toward the end of the light path, but no matter where you do damage, Nezarak will sometimes still be launching nukes at your team, just being generally really annoying. So we always put a well down to prevent any unwanted deaths that might happen while we're waiting for him to enter the damage phase. But after some time, he'll eventually get laser beamed and then we'll be open for damage. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but again, five Thunderlords in Divinity right now is by far the easiest damage method. Five rockets plus G-Horn can be faster, but he moves around so much during the damage phase that it's just so easy to miss rockets, significantly lowering your DPS. Do whatever damage you can in the 30 seconds or so that you can, and then rinse and repeat these same steps until Nazarak is dead. He does have a final stand mechanic, but there's really nothing else that changes. Just keep the Divinity and Thunderlords on him and whittle him down. And then once you're done with that, go ahead and pick up your free red border at the end. Hopefully you did that. And then make sure to stop by the spoils chest at the end as well to pick up another red border that you've already found for 20 spoils of conquest. 
This is such a new raid that I'm pretty sure more optimal methods will come out at some point, but this whole guide is what we've done to pretty consistently get very easy clears. I really hope this helped you, and if you're looking for a team to run this with, please join the Discord where we can try to get you a clear. Alright everyone, thanks so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.